Turn your Bibles to the book of Jude as we continue our journey through the Bible, the book of Jude. And in today's message, we'll be looking at verses 5 through 16. And the title of this message is Apostasy from the Faith. Apostasy from the Faith. Now, to recap what we briefly covered in last week's message in verses 1 through 4, we see how Jude identified himself as a bondservant uh, or a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And then he addresses the letter. He gives three designations that are true of all believers, that they are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved or kept <clears throat> in Jesus Christ. God has called these believers out of the world by the gospel to belong to himself. They are then set apart, sanctified by God, to be God's special and pure people. And then we see how they are marvelously uh, preserved or kept secure in Jesus Christ. So it seems like called looks to the past, whereas love looks to the present and kept looks to the future. And then Jude prayed that these three qualities, mercy, peace, and love, would overflow, be multiplied in the believers' lives. And so this greeting reflected a gracious concern for the welfare of his readers. And just imagine what if these qualities uh, were truly present in every believer's lives. Mercy, peace, and love. That love that is unconditional, the peace that passes all understanding. It's that calmness, the quietness, that rest that we have. And that mercy is that showing uh, compassion uh, to to people, uh, whether they're suffering or struggling, uh, whatever it is. But it's just showing that mercy and compassion. Imagine what these qualities would be like uh, for the believer, but also what it would look like in the world. Now, in verses 3 through 4, we see uh, the reason for Jude's theme for contending for the faith. And again, he was planning on writing concerning their common salvation. Instead, he wrote uh, urging his readers to contend earnestly for the faith. Since Jude says that this faith was once for all, or completely wholly, uh, handed down, he's implying that there was a, a body of truth that had been communicated from the apostles. Jesus had promised the apostles, if you remember in the upper room in John chapter 14, that the Spirit would teach them all things and guide them into all truth. Even in the church early days, uh, when they first started out in the book of Acts, there was this recognized content of accepted belief. And then the, the reasoning for the Lord's leading in verse 4, uh, where we see how these, again, false teachers have crept into the church. Uh, it was predicted long ago, and even as we just finished the second Peter, uh, we, we see that there is a forewarning that the ungodly person who deny our only Lord and Master uh, would come. So there's these false teachers that would creep in, these apostates. And so these individuals reviewed God's grace as an excuse for open sin. That was part of their characteristics. Now, this takes on uh, to this next section uh, of the book where we see examples of these apostates or false teachers uh, from the faith. Uh, so in verse 5 through 19 is, is really one paragraph in the original language. And what we're going to see within this you know, next several verses is how Jude uses uh, several Old Testament accounts, uh, examples, and descriptions of the ungodly. False teachers were subverting and undermining the Word of God, especially the Gospel. And you have these errant beliefs that produces wrong or evil behavior. And so Jude said that these unrepentant false teachers would eventually face judgment. And sooner or later, divine justice will catch up to these uh, ungodly men, just as it was in Old Testament times. Hence why we see these examples. And so Jude continues this letter in this line and his plan to show um, how the problems that we face as churches today have always been the problem of God's people. And so Jude is going to give a series of warnings that we see throughout the Bible. And to start off, there are three examples of the fact of rebellion against God. It never goes well. It never succeeds. And the, the first one is kind of out of chronological order, probably to uh, and perhaps to show the heightened of its significance. So with that in mind, 
Let's take a ver- the fir- uh, verse 5 through 7, and we notice that there are three warning uh, reminders. In verse 5 it says, but I re- want to remind you, uh, though you once knew this. And pause right there. So before Jude gets into the details of Israel's rebellion that he's addressed the church, um, and apparently they had a selective memory, kind of like most people today, selective memory. It is you know, human nature for that matter, that we're prone to forget, always needing to have reminders, especially of those things that uh, we have learned in the past, or things that are eternal, and how easy and how natural it is to forget. And there's numerous scriptures that speak to us of the necessity uh, of remembrance, remembering the things of the Lord, what he's done for us, what he's spoken to us, from where he has taken us and brought us. And one of the greatest problems that the nation of Israel, after their deliverance from Egypt, was they forgot God. Uh, After all he's done for them, they simply just didn't, you know, have that relationship with God. They forgot God uh, and all his wonders. So as they did, so do we always need constant reminders by remembering and bringing constant things to mind, the things that we know, the things that we have heard, uh, so we don't become forgetful hearers of the word. And the phrase, though you once knew this, and it's easy, again, for believers to have a mindset to say, oh, I already know this. And then they kind of doze off or just tune out or they still forget. Uh, So even though these believers Jude was writing to knew these things, he wanted to remind them of the Lord's dealings with Israel in this verse. And so the rebellion in the wilderness was common known among the Jews, and and I'm sure it was taught even in the early believers in the early church as they're starting out, just these lessons to be learned, but it's, it's going through the word as well. And so... Uh, Jude knew that they had disregard for the fundamental truth. Uh, And for the same reason, they decided to forget the struggles of the wilderness. And I fear that that's happening with way too many people today. They forget uh, and uh, overlook certain teachings and doctrines of Scripture uh, when it doesn't suit their lifestyle or their way of thinking, or they just get bored, you know, and that becomes a heart problem. Anyways, verse 5 continues that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. So, first Jude brings to remembrance the, the, the people delivered by God. And you know the story, again, the bondage of in Israel or uh, in Egypt for 400 years. The Israelites cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up Moses as a deliverer and, and, and worked powerfully through him. And then as you go through the, the journeys in the book of uh, Exodus, and you can see just the miraculous work there. And the believers, again, they knew these examples. And so Jude wanted to remind them just how God had judged sin and rebellion in the past. And such judgment awaited uh, the sin and rebellion of these false teachers and these apostates that were leading people astray. And so here in verse 5, Jude reminds his readers about um, God's people, Israel, who, though they were delivered from Egypt, refused to trust God and enter the promised land, as Numbers 14 mentions. And so God's people had been recipients of God's deliverance and seen his incredible miracles and accomplishing their exodus out of Egypt. But when they arrived at the entrance of the promised land, many rebelled against God, refusing to believe that he could or that he would protect them. And so this unbelief uh, resulted in destruction. Uh, We're reminded in Hebrews chapter uh, 3. And verse 16 through 19 says, Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those uh, Moses led out of Egypt and whom God was angry for 40 years? Was not those who sinned and whose body fell in the desert? And whom did God swear that they will never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And that was one of the key sins of the nation of Israel, the unbelief that kept them wandering uh, throughout the wilderness for those 40 years. Uh, It's not that they didn't believe in God, but they didn't believe God and his word and obey him. And so this unbelief, which led to the displeasing God, lusting after evil things, idolatry, fornication, presumption, murmuring, it all came out of the root sin of unbelief. And 
therefore, again, we also need to take heed, lest we also be in and have this evil heart of unbelief and depart from the living God. So this is why this is such a, a crucial warning for us. And so Jude used this is uh, experience here uh, of Israel on the thresh of the going into the promised land to explain that even among God's people can turn away. So it could be you, it could be me, if we're not careful. And again, one of the key themes on this book, as we'll see in verse 21, to keep yourself in the love of God. So if you don't keep yourself in the love of God, then it's easy for us to fall away, to, to go astray. So the false teachers had come from the ranks within believers. And while not truly followers of Christ, they were saying they were doing many of the right things, even though that they were teaching their wrong doctrines. And so they understood that they could find deliverance from bondage to sin, uh, like bondage to Egypt, yet they were choosing sin over salvation. And obvious result here, as Jude wrote, would be that they, uh, like the disobedient Israelites would be destroyed. So that's the example there. The second example as we continue on in verse 6 is that the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their abode had reserved in everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. So here we see how Jude deals with the fall of Satan and his angels, those beings who were created of God who rebelled. And so in the second example of God's punishment of disobedience describes how certain angels who did not uh, keep their position but left their proper dwelling. So not only can those uh, delivered by God fail to keep themselves in the love of God, but so can those who are worshippers of God. That's one of the key things that we see within this verse here. Lucifer, as you know, was the leader, the worshiper uh, of heaven. Uh, he was called the anointed cherub, as Ezekiel 28 uh, mentions, uh, up until the day he says, oh, I'm going to be like God. So that pride uh, launched him into that full rebellion in which a third of the angels end up following him. So the once pure, holy, living in the presence of God, uh, these angels gave in to the pride and joined Satan to rebel against God. They left their positions uh, and their dwelling with the Lord, resulting, as we'll see, eventual doom. Even the Apostle Peter, as we saw in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that God did not spare the angels when they sinned. So here the worshippers of God in heaven became demons in hell, you know, because they did not ultimately keep themselves in the love of God. They turned the, the pride. And so Jude's readers uh, apparently understood this meaning as well as the implication that if God didn't spare the angels, neither will he spare these false teachers and these apostates. Pride and lust had led to war and the angels fall. The false teachers' pride and lust will lead to judgment and destruction. And as for these disobedient angels, God kept them in eternal change in the deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. So these sinful angels uh, will be kept in a place of punishment until the great day of judgment, when they face their final doom, where they will eventually be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone for all eternity. So all who rebel against God and refuse his salvation will find themselves bound in everlasting chains of darkness. The apostates, the false teachers, have rejected the mercies of God for their own sinful desires and seek to corrupt the gospel. And so the judgment for them is coming. So we can be sure of that. So we just need to continue to be on guard uh, for our hearts and our minds to keep ourselves in the love of God. Then the third example in verse 7, notice it says, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to the, these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, have gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So as a third example of God's judgment of disobedience, Jude pointed out that Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities had been destroyed by God. So the inhabitants were so full of sin that God wiped off these cities off the, the, the face of the map, off the face of the earth. And the people that were following their own sinful natures um, 
indulging in sexual immorality and pursuing unnatural lust. Now, as you go back to Genesis chapter 18 and 19 that describes this uh, situation, the scene of the sinfulness of these cities, and Genesis 19 tells us when the angels in, uh, in the form of men visited Sodom, and some homosexual men in the city wanted to rape these men who were visiting Lot, and thus they pursued unnatural lust by desiring sexual relations with visiting men. So, homosexuality and perversion brought a punishment of eternal fire when God rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. And after the fire destruction, later on in the chapter, in verse 27-28, we see how Abraham looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and saw the smoke of the land going up like the smoke of a furnace. And what a sight that must have been to see. How heartbreaking it is to see that as well. But just the, the shock and awe, kind of like a nuclear bomb going off. And so it was the judgment of God coming down uh, so complete that the destruction, even the surrounding cities, no longer exist. Uh, some of the archaeologists believe that the, under the, the waters of the Dead Sea is where these cities perhaps may be. And so the Bible describes homosexual sin as immoral, as unnatural, and any attempt to, to label as merely as just an alternative lifestyle contradicts the Bible. The, the, the specific perversion is discussed by even the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. says, Women exchange their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of their error which is due. So homosexuality is not uh, a physical, physically natural, you know, biologically natural, you know, because two people of the same gender engaging in sexual activities for which they're not atomically created, whereas male and females' bodies, they fit together naturally. So, uh, and even as we see, even back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, how God has ordained man to be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So this natural fits uh, enables a man and woman to be united together, to join together, to become uh, one together. Now, while we're on the topic of homosexuality, kind of a, as a side topic here, again, there's a lot of other passages of Scripture that talk about homosexuality. Leviticus 18, 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, kind of in a general context. And from these passages, you learn that the Bible clearly condemns homosexual sin and behavior. God's plan for natural sexual relationships Relationships is between a man and a woman, uh, which was his ideal and how he created uh, our, our bodies and his creation. Alongside God's condemnation of sin is his offer of forgiveness. So no matter what sin we do, there is forgiveness for all people. Uh, homosexuality may be considered acceptable in today's society and even in some churches, but society uh, and government does not set the standard for God's law. Many homosexuals believe that it, uh, their desires are normal and that they have the right to express them, like every other person. But you see, God doesn't obligate nor encourage us to fulfill all our desires, especially of the flesh, not even the normal ones. Uh, just because someone has a desire to kill someone doesn't mean they follow through with it. God desires uh, that uh, we follow Him and obey Him. Desires that violate His law must be controlled. And so so God can forgive uh, sexual sin just as he forgives all other sins. We also see within these passages of scripture how temptation can be overcome by God's grace. And so um, people who have these um, desires of homosexuality or homosexual desires, however you want to phrase that, uh, can and, and must resist acting upon them. And so God offers his grace and his mercy and will show the way out of sin into the light of his freedom 
and of his grace and his love. And like all sinners, homosexuals are called to repent. So it doesn't matter who you are, what sin you are involved in, we're all called to repent. So as the Bible calls homosexual sex a sin, it must be repented, just like any other sin uh, that any person does. All sin must be repented. And one of the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit is to convict us uh, as believers of our sin. And as we're convicted of it, we confess our sin, we repent of our sin, uh, don't continue down that uh, in sin as a lifestyle, then we are cleansed and we are restored to fellowship with God. So again, we see this uh, issue here within the Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of these cities, going back to our text here, serves as an example of what will happen to people who refuse to obey God. The fire that reigned on these evil cities pictures the fire that awaits unrepentant sinners. And so many people don't want to believe that God will punish people with eternal fire for rejecting him, but this is clearly taught in Scripture. Sinners who don't seek uh, forgiveness from God are going to face eternal damnation, eternal darkness, eternal uh, fire. And so June warns all those who rebel against and ignore or reject God, this is what's going to happen. And so we see the sin of Israel was rebellious unbelief. As we just saw in Hebrews chapter 3. The sin of the angels uh, was rebelling against the throne of God. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was indulging in unnatural lust. Unbelief, rebellion against authority, sensual indulgence were sin characteristic of these false teachers and apostates. So the conclusion here is obvious that the apostates will be judged. The false teachers will be judged. But meanwhile, as believers as soldiers of Christ we got to stay on duty and see that these false teachers do not creep into the ranks within our churches and our fellowships and to lead people astray so we need to be on guard there so what can we do practically to oppose the enemy and maintain the purity uh, within the church and again for one thing we got to know the Word of God, friends. Uh, we we got to be encouraged to defend it. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Take heed to yourself, as it says in 1 Timothy 4.16, and unto the doctrine. And so every local church needs to be a place where you are properly taught and fed the Word of God. Uh, and, and the best way to do that is to go expositionally through the Bible, through the whole counsel of God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Uh, but it's not just going through that, but it's, you got to be doers of it as well. The other thing we need to do is to watch and pray, to be alert and watchful, you know, and, and we need to be praying for our, our leaders within our churches, our elders, our pastor, be alert, be watchful uh, of what goes on. And many a church, because of following false teachers, have gone into apostasy. They should uh, have kind of on the name written across their doors, Ichabod, as the, the glory has departed. So when you do things that are unbiblical and you're stri leaving uh, the core fundamental doctrines of, of Christianity and, and the Word of God, you know, you're going down in a road of apostasy. Rarely does a church uh, that abandons uh, God's truth do they see? Do we hear them even repenting and returning to the Lord? Uh, and it's often, as it says in Song of Solomon, that little fox spoil the vines, which means uh, the the small and even sometimes insignificant compromises in God's word is that leaven that destroys the whole lump as an example. So God forbid that any true pastor or child of God become complacent or give an inch of ground to the uh, false teachers, the apostates, the wolves, if you will, that are circling through and around our congregations and churches ready to, to devour. And they usually devour those who are weak, those who are not really rooted and grounded. And you see how people are just kind of picked off you know, and led astray. Uh, and so as soldiers of the Lord, we need to stand together in battle for the truth, to contend for the faith. Now in verses 8 through 10, we see that Jude turns his attention to the apostates of his day, how they share the same character and promote the same agenda as the previous generations had. And uh, he ties them uh, with the previous verses with the word likewise. Notice verse uh, 8, likewise. 
these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Jude refers to a, a subject of present-day uh, apostates and launches into the description of their sins, their indictments, their counterparts in nature, their doom, and their ungodly words and deeds, as we'll see uh, from verse 8 or yeah, verse eight through 16. Now, there are three things that are mentioned here uh, worth noting in verse 8. First of all is the matter of their sins. By dreaming, they defile the flesh. So their, their thought life is messed up. It's polluted. They're living in a world of filthy fantasies. They even find fulfillment of their dreams in sexual immorality like the men of Sodom. And apparently anything that they could conceive in their minds, they acted out in their flesh. There is no restraint. There is no remorse. We also, you see, live in a day and age where anything goes mentality. Humanity continues to sink lower and lower into the depths of depravity. There's no limits. There's no restraints. And it seems that there's no conscience when it comes to sin these days. The second thing that we notice here is they reject authority. So they, they do whatever is right in their own eyes, as we can take the phrase from the book of uh, Judges. Uh, so they did what was right. They're rejecting authority. And this has the idea of power, authority, or lordship. So the apostates refuse to submit to the authority of another, and especially the Lord himself. So they allow a spirit of lawlessness to control them. And so we, we see much of this rebellion in our day and age against authority, especially amongst the young generation. They have also an entitlement attitude which goes with this rebellion. Even in the church, there is rebellion, and this could be linked to a person's um, relationship with the Lord. If he is not master of your life and he's truly Lord, then you're not going to be submitting to him. And we're seeing those who have abandoned the truth of God's word because, well, it's not popular, or it goes against their desires and their wants, and, and there's nothing more than just rebellion and uh, against authority and pride. And so we can see that feeds their 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 hearts and their rebellion and how they're going to reject authority any person that's above them if you will in a leadership position they're rejecting authority and then thirdly we see uh, they speak evil of dignitaries to speak evil is the same word as revile which also means to blaspheme to slander uh, to speak evil of especially uh, to speak profanely of sacred matters including god himself uh, it's also speaking of uh, um, angels as well uh, so these false teachers weren't just irreverent in some mild sense they were blasphemers uh, the, the the supreme dignitary again is the lord jesus christ uh, they speak evil of the ministries that God has set in the church, of elders, of pastors, of deacons, and um, other leaders in that way. Uh, they speak evil against rulers in government. So they speak disrespectfully, uh, spitefully against authority, whether it's divine, angelic, or even human. And remember, <clears throat> actions speak louder than words. So one can you don't even have to say a word and still be guilty of rebellion because it's in your heart. So you might not be saying it out loud, but your heart is going along with it. So if you have a problem with God's word or his will for your life, then you need to humble yourself. You need to repent and get before the Lord and, and seek to serve him in complete surrender. Verse 9 goes on with a new illustration or example. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So in this respect, they, they, they take liberties, the apostates, the false teachers, that even which Michael the archangel would reject. Now, as we see here, Jude shares this incident which is found nowhere else in the Bible. And so the question naturally arises, well, where did he get this information? Some say that perhaps uh, the information was passed down by tradition. Uh, perhaps that could have happened. But more likely and more, uh, I guess, a satisfying explanation is that this information was supernaturally revealed to Jude by the same Holy Spirit who moved him to write this letter. 
as did all the other letters and, and writers of the, the Bible. Now, we have no definite knowledge why the dispute arose between Michael and Satan about the body of Moses. We do know that Moses was buried by God in the valley of Moab, but it's not unlikely that Satan would want to know the spot so that he could perhaps build a shrine there. Then Israel would turn into idolatrous worship of Moses' bones. And as the angelic representative of the people of Israel, as we will see later on in Daniel chapter 10, Michael would strive to preserve the people from this form of idolatry by keeping the burial site secret. But the important point is this. Even if Michael the archangel, one of whom God will use to cast down Satan from heaven, as Revelation chapter 12 uh, mentions, uh, he still didn't presume to speak reproachfully to the one who rules in the realm of demons. Uh, he left such rebuking to God. So it seems that Jude wanted the believers to understand that even the archangel, uh, who are very careful about how they addressed other powers, even the evil ones, how much more should uh, mere people watch their words when they speak of celestial powers and good and, and evil. And so even uh, a powerful angel like Michael didn't dare to speak a judgment in behalf of God. Um, and, and neither should the false teachers claim to speak for God whom they knew nothing uh, about him as verse uh, conti uh, 10 continues but they speak but these speak sorry evil of whatever they do not know for whatever they know naturally like brute beasts and these things they corrupt themselves so in contrast to Michael's refusal to slander even Satan himself, the false teachers slandered celestial beings and spoke abusively, uh, blasphemy against whatever they don't understand. So their words are filled with evil and animosity toward which th that is good and that which is right. They speak evil of those things which they don't know. Uh, and do not understand. Uh, and the word for know here is the Greek word oida, which is kind of different from the one that's going to be used a little bit later, which means to see, to perceive, or to discern. So they speak evil of the things they, they don't see, they don't understand, and their hearts have been blinded to the things of God, and in ignorance they blaspheme his ways. And many of these false teachers claim to possess a superior secret knowledge that gave them authority. They have a revelation that no one else has, you know, and so that they consider themselves to be the only ones that can really understand God. So you need to trust them and go to them and listen to them, uh, which again is false. You know, we have everything that we need that pertains to life, godliness through the Word of God, and, and we have the Holy Spirit to confirm that. The Holy Spirit will never confer, uh, contradict the Word of God. And so, as we see with these apostates, by their slander, they reveal not superior knowledge, but more or less uh, profound ignorance. In fact, in all their pride, they're no better than the unreasoning animals, like brute beasts, as you see the example here. So, by that example... Jude is basically declaring it's impossible to reason with them. They are opposed to truth and the Lord, and they won't listen to reason. They, they are so consumed in their way, they refuse to even consider truth. So, their refusal to heed God's voice left them enslaved to sin and in their sinful passions. And even though they claim to be uh, able to indulge themselves without retribution, eventually they will be destroyed by those sins. Verse 11 continues where Jude now speaks of the characteristics that are apparent in condemning these apostates. And, and he starts out by saying, Woe unto them. Uh, it says, Woe, un Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily to the heir of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, one of the things to grasp about this short little book of Jude is that it sweeps over much biblical history as if the, the reader's already familiar with lots of Bible stories and what's taken place. And that's why Jude's best appreciated with some prior uh, knowledge of other stories that we get from Genesis and also Numbers. Uh, and here we see Jude gives three classic examples of men in the Old Testament who had lived as they pleased and been punished for doing so. These stories illustrate attitudes that are typical of false teachers and apostates. 
pride, selfishness, greed, jealousy, lust for power, and disregard for God's will and God's word. So no wonder Jude exclaimed to them, Woe to them! Their, their grave errors would result in complete destruction. So the first example and explanation for why, again, people no longer experience the love of God in their lives is they've gone the way of Cain, who sinned because of jealousy. So Cain was the type of unloving man who cared nothing for his brother, envied him because Abel's deeds were good and his own bad. Uh, the way of Cain is the way of anger. He was angry with his brother because God blessed Abel, but he didn't bless Cain. And perhaps Cain must have thought, hey, that's not fair. We both offered sacrifices to God. Abel brought a lamb. I brought the fruit of my labor from the garden. You know, but God blessed my brothers and not mine. And we can see how anger took root in Cain's heart that he killed his brother. And here's the thing, friends. If you've got anger, if you've got bitterness uh, with someone or maybe unforgiveness in your heart, listen, maybe you're going after the way of Cain. You need to stop. You need to repent. You need to get that situation sorted out before it destroys your life. So watch out, friends, for your anger, your jealousy, their envy in your heart. It will pull you. It will draw you away from the place where you did and once enjoyed the presence of God and, and the love of God. So Jude draws our attention to not only the way and the danger of Cain, but he also goes on to the other example, to the greed of Balaam. Now, if you remember the story, how the children of Israel uh, were on their way to the promised land, and uh, they're passing by the land of Moab, and the king of Moab, uh, Balak, and he says, hey, you know, these people are coming our way, so we got to do something, you know, otherwise we're going to get trampled by these millions of people coming out. And so, knowing of a prophet in the area named Balaam, Balak sent messengers to ask him to curse the approaching Israelites. And so Balaam said to the messengers that came to him, says, oh, I, I need to talk to the Lord about this. And even before Balaam asked, you know, the Lord told him not to curse uh, the Israelites. This is a uh, story found in Numbers 22. So the messengers returned to Balak with the word uh, that Balaam refused to join them. And so Balak in turn, you know, sent some more guys to, you know, some really important guys to go tell, have this word with him. So they arrive, you know, in their flashy clothes and they said, oh, you need to come with us and you'll be blessed. And, and Balaam basically saying, listen, guys, even if you offered me a house and uh, full of silver and gold, hint, hint, wink, wink, you know, I wouldn't go with you. So once again, the messengers return empty-handed. And the third time they appeared before Balaam, and this time offering him a portion of wealth and honor. And so a third time, Balaam says, oh, I need to seek the Lord. And this time the Lord gave him permission to go. And so off Balaam went. And as he was going, uh, an angel appeared to his donkey, causing the donkey to crash into a wall and smashing Balaam's foot against uh, the wall in the process. And so then he ends up yelling and cursing, you know, um, getting angry with the donkey and say, you dumb donkey, you crushed my foot, you know, as he's beating his donkey. And the donkey responds and talks back to him and says, why are you beating me? Haven't I been a good donkey all these years, you know, and, and I've never gotten any, haven't had any problems, you know, don't you see there's an angel standing there in front of me, preventing me, taking you where you ought not to go? And yet even talking to the donkey didn't deter Balaam. So he continued on until he reached the mountain overlooking the Israelite camp. And then he opened his mouth to try to curse them, but what came out was a blessing. And so then Balak, the king, and again, he gets upset, says, I hired you to curse them, not to bless them. Maybe we need to change location. So they go to another location, they build an altar there, and once more Balaam stood to try to curse them. Once more, all that came out was a blessing. Now, the, the story here, again, in the error of Balaam, uh, lays in the fact that he didn't understand God's grace. Balaam thought that because people were rebellious and evil, that God surely wanted to destroy them. And consequently, knowing that even though he couldn't curse the Israelites, the Israelites could bring a curse upon themselves, though. And so Balaam told um, Balak, 
that if the Moabite women parade themselves in front of the Jewish men, and during these romantic dances and interludes, uh, that they were sure to follow the Moabite women and be introduced, you know, the, the, the Jewish men to their idols. And that's what happened. Balak was right. In fact, the book of Numbers in chapter 25, we read that the people did eat and bowed to their gods. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against um, Israel and, and close to 24,000 people died as a result. So why did Balaam end up as a heretic, a, a loser? Because of greed. With greed, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never be thankful. You'll always want a little more. And you go in this vicious, nasty, dangerous cycle. So watch out, friends. You know, greed will remove you from the place that God wants you. It will destroy your heart, your mind, your perception of things, your motivation. And then we see the third example here of Korah's sin was envy. So, in short, uh, this, this, he was a, a priest uh, that didn't like his role, wanted to be in charge. And he died along many others who joined him in rebellion against Moses. We find a story again in Numbers 16 where Korah essentially questioning Moses, you know, and asking him, hey, who made you in charge? Who, who made you the, the, the head honcho, if you will? Uh, you, I have just as much to write to determine the direction of this nation as you you do you know so so why are you here um and, and and what happened to Korah is that he led a rebellion that resulted in the death of nearly 15,000 of God's people because of envy because he wanted a, a position that God hadn't called him to so listen friends we all need to be aware of jealousy we need to be aware of greed we need to be aware of envy wanting someone else's position or what they have the, the thing is, we just need to rest in the place that God has us. Be content. Don't strive in life. Don't strive for leadership positions in this particular case. The Lord will place you right where you, he wants you to be and where you should be. Uh, this doesn't mean we shouldn't um, uh, want to be all that God wants us to be. You know, We need to just continue to grow and develop in our maturity, in our character. But th let the Lord raise you up. Let the Lord appoint you and place you where uh, he wants you to be instead of you striving and pushing and, and making all these different moves. You know, And, and we see what eventually happened to Korah. Again, the, the ground opened up and sucked him in along with all those that were in rebellion against the leadership um, that we see here and that's the easiest way to find yourself in a pit is be envious of another person's position of leadership or uh, whatever envious uh, thing that's going on in your heart it will just destroy you now you, you don't know what you're heading in for if, if you're trying to strive for those positions of leadership. You, you don't see what you're getting in, in yourself into. And, and before you know it, uh, your world will stop come crashing down upon you. The pressures, the stress will get you eventually because if you haven't been called into there, you know, you don't have the, the developed character or the competency for those leadership position. And so, again, it's a, it's a very powerful lesson to learn. God has an entirely different way of looking at things than we do. And in his word, he says uh, through Jude to you, to me, is that these three specific areas that will keep you from enjoying and experiencing my love and having a relationship with me, if we follow through these examples and these Old Testament pictures that we see that Jude, uh, he paints with these false teachers and with these apostates. They are without love like Cain. They are greedy for money like Balaam. They are insubordinate to God-appointed authorities like Korah. So certain was the end of these false teachers that Jude even wrote about them more in the past tense that they have been destroyed. So with all three stories they have in common is that they're all people who had some knowledge of God and his desire to rule over our lives. And all three in their own ways rebelled against the wisdom and the ways of God and the plans of God. And the reason we get these stories here in Jude is to emphasize the fact that all throughout history there are people who are 
aware of the presence of God, yet work to prevent his will from being done. The way of Cain is the way of hatred and murder and jealousy. The, the error of Balaam was that of the love of money. The, and then Korah's rebellion was pride, insolence, insubordination, and he didn't want to accept the leadership that God had appointed as leader. Verse 12 continues with uh, the other descriptions here. These are spots in your love feasts. They are feasts with... Uh out fear, uh, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carrying ab about the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging uh, waves of the sea, foaming at their own shame, wandering stars in whom is preserved the blackness and darkness forever. So now these verses, we notice that Jude chooses five similes from the world of nature to put picture the, the character and the destiny of these apostates. And, and for those who don't know what a simile is, a simile is a figure of speech uh, that kind of compares two different things. Uh, oftentimes in a sentence it would be like using the words like or as or if or than. Anyways, Certain men who've crept in unnoticed, as we saw back in verse 4, were like those, like Korah, like Cain, like Balaam, who uh, endangered God's people, seeking to woo them away from the simplicity of God's grace. And so uh, Jude calls them spots, but a better translation are hidden reefs or hidden rocks. So that graphically depicts the unseen nature of uh, and the danger that they pose. The reefs of the undersea uh, coral formations usually located close to the shore. And so they potentially can harm the ships because they can rip open the bottom of the hulls, causing the vessels to sink. And like these hidden reefs, these apostates and false teachers uh, that have crept in embed themselves under the surface of these love feasts, the, the meals that they were having together. And so which they tore into unsuspecting uh, people with their lives lies and wickedness and slander and false doctrine. You know, they, they joined in your, the, the fellowship of these churches and the meetings and the meals that they would have together um, that you'd be celebrating the grace and the goodness of God, but they had a hidden agenda when they attended. Like hidden rocks, they blend in presently, but they will cause you to crash eventually. And then he goes on to use uh, even stronger metaphor to describe these uh, false teachers. Uh, so the the verse mentions they serve only themselves. The the word translated serving or feeding means shepherding. So instead of the shepherd feeding and caring for the needs of the people, they're only taking care of themselves. And then uh, verse twelve describes the water waterless clouds. Uh, that means that they seem to have all sorts of wonderful things to say, but their teaching just leaves uh, only to dry, discouraging days. All fluff and no substance, which describes so many churches today, unfortunately. And again, just because the pastor and the teachers and what is coming from these churches is all fluff and entertainment doesn't mean they're all apostate, but again, they're heading toward that direction when they don't teach uh, the Word of God. Uh, Anyways, uh, they all appear to hold the, the promise of refreshment to the parched countryside, but be carried along by the winds and leaving disappointment and disillusion. Verse 12 continues, they are like trees whose uh, fruit withers without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. So because they're dead trees, they're not going to be bearing fruit. And again, in, in vivid and colorful language, Jude strung together four word pictures to communicate the emptiness of their spiritual lives. Verse 13 uh, mentions that the raging waves of the sea foaming out their shame. So the, the wild waves, there's a lot of motion. It's erratic, meaningless, and wasted energy. Uh, and then it goes on to say that it talks about the wandering star in whom is reserved the blackness of the darkness forever. So finally, Jude likens the false teacher to wandering or shooting stars. Uh, so he's not referring to the, the fixed stars or planets because they have definite positions and orbits, but he's referring to those like the, the meteors, the falling stars that uh, suddenly appear and then vanish into the darkness, never to be seen again. The blackness, darkness forever, hence the eternal destiny of these godless people. Back in verse 6, then darkness is mentioned in relation to the fallen angels who suffer darkness as part of their 
punishment for rebellion against God. So what an appropriate description of these false teachers and what's going to happen to them. It's impossible, you see, to get spiritual direction from these apostates and false teachers and religious wandering uh, falling stars who blaze brightly for a moment and then fizzle out into the darkness like fireworks. The same problem Jude is addressing affects the body of Christ today. False teachers mouth great swelling words, continue to peddle their phony or false doctrine to anyone who will listen or anyone who would give them attention. And so if you've been walking with the Lord for any period of time, you know that as soon as one strange doctrine, uh, another one blows through as well. Uh, so just the cycles continue uh, since the beginning of the uh, church. Uh, all kinds of crazy doctrines that go on uh, out there that it's unbiblical. And that's why it's so important uh, to get rooted and grounded in God's word. Uh, so you can have some discernment. You know how to test all things, hold fast what is good, uh, what is being said, what is being taught. So you don't get fooled into deception. Uh, this is why it's so important to, to be taught uh, the word of God as well. So these false teachers talked a lot, uh, but had no substance and their words were lies. Verse 14 continues uh, with another trio. So it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. So this verse, Enoch, uh, is unique to Jude. Uh, this is the third time, by the way, that he's mentioned in the New Testament. The first one we see in the genealogies in uh, Luke chapter 3. Uh, we also see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, and then here in Jude. Now, why did Jude choose this quote from Enoch? Uh, perhaps it could be, and it, and it most likely came from a book called uh, One Enoch, uh, which is in the Apocrypha. Uh, that's a whole other discussion to talk about that. But perhaps the reason that uh, Jude got this um, uh, quote, uh, perhaps is because of the threefold repetition of the word uh, ungodly. Uh, that might have been this important connection. So just as Jude used three examples in uh, verses 5 through 7 and, ver and 3 in verse 11, uh, here ungodly is mentioned more than three times. Another important connection could be between Enoch and Cain. Uh, just as Cain represented the first kind of uh, unbelieving disobedience, Enoch may represent the kind of person uh, in that heir uh, to whom the prophecy of judgment is connected. Uh, so again, Enoch is introduced to us in Genesis chapter 5, and in order uh, that we don't mistake him from someone else, Jude points out that he is the seventh from Adam. So Enoch was the one who walked with God, and he was not, for God took him, as Genesis 5.24 mentions. And he was the first one to experience the rapture, if you will. A, a preview of the great rapture of the church when Christ returns. So he was uh, taken before the flood came, just like the church will be raptured before the tribulation period. So not only was Enoch uh, one who walked with God, but he was a righteous man. Uh, so in Hebrews tells us that by faith, Enoch was translated, uh, which again, where we see the rapture he's taken, uh, he didn't see death. Uh, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So not only was Enoch a man of faith, he was a righteous man, but Jude tells us that he was a prophet who foretold that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his saints. So this information is not found in Genesis, nor is it found anywhere else. So where did Jude get this sort of information and this prophecy of Enoch? Well, the simple answer is the Lord himself, just as the Lord spoke uh, to uh, and, and uh, Jude wrote it down, and just as he uh, inspires and uh, you know, other uh, writers of the, the Bible as well. So this is how the, the Lord spoke to Jude, and Jude just wrote it down, this particular prophecy. So Enoch prophesied that the apostates of the last days, God revealed to Enoch the truth of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ the second time with great power and glory. Verse 15 goes on to say, to execute on uh, judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among the un their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
it's immediately obvious the, that this bears the very uh, noticeable resemblance of what Jude is saying here. Uh, that Jesus, again, Christ came the first time as a lamb, uh, which was taken away the sins of the world, as uh, John uh, 1, 9, uh, 29 tells us. And when he comes the second time, he will come as a faithful and true. In righteousness he judged and makes war, as Revelation 19, 11 tells us. So within this passage, we see uh, the second coming of Christ is uh, a twofold purpose. One is to execute judgment. So the world will be ripe for judgment when Christ returns. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses uh, 7 through 9 says that when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with these mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the first purpose is to execute judgment uh, when Christ comes back, and then secondly, to convict the ungodly. So this has the idea of convicting uh, someone when they're wrong, uh, to reveal their fault, their error, to prove that they are guilty. So this conviction is directed against all ungodly. And the word ungodly, as you notice here, is used some four times in this verse. This ungodliness involves both deed and speech, as you see the last part of the verse here. And so their ungodly deeds of the flesh have been pointed out in verse 4, which we see licentiousness. In verse uh, 7, we see the fornication there and verse 11 you see covetousness so their ungodly speech was mentioned in verse 4 against the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and in verses 10 through or 8 through 10 you kind of see it's against these in, invisible angelic forces and, and high places so false teachers will give an account of their ungodly deeds when the Lord returns and then the final description or characteristics of the apostates or false teachers in verse 16. These are grumblers or murmurs, complainers, uh, walking uh, according to their own lusts and, and mouths great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. So here Jude completes this description and emphasizes even more why these apostates and false teachers are so dangerous. And as we see the list of these sinful characteristics of the ungodly, uh, we see how they're grumbling, grumblers. Uh, you know, they express discontent uh, based on coveting, uh, complainers or murmurs, finding fault, blaming others for their circumstances and their problems, uh, as well as the um, lack of self-control, being unable to say no to evil desires. You see their arrogance and their pride. They're boasting about themselves and deceitful uh, selfishness, using flattery for selfish gain. So knowing these things, again, we're amazed that anyone would want to listen and follow these apostates and go after them and sit under them. But yet, unfortunately, many people are doing that today. And there's something in fallen human nature that loves a lie, that is willing to follow it, uh, no matter where it may lead. And that's the problem with these apostates. They lie to people and people are, are you know, going after it. Uh, most of the time it just leads to hurt and wounds as people will eventually, if they uh, come to their senses and they see what's really going on. But the successes, if you will, of these apostates, it's only temporary. You know, they're... they're what they're doing here is only temporary. Judgment is coming for them. And every generation, as we see, has always faced opposition and adversity. They've always faced uh, these sort of uh, issues within uh, their lives and within the churches. Uh, and so we need the strength and the wisdom of the Lord uh, in these situations and discernments. And so may we heed the warnings and exhortations uh, of the Word of God and of the Holy Spirit. May we be discerning of the things that we hear and that we read. And may we continue to walk in the wisdom and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ, to walk in wisdom, to walk in love, and that we keep ourselves in the love of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your word. I pray that we'd all be doers of your word. I pray that we would be sensitive to your voice and that we'd have a hunger and thirst for your word and for righteousness and the hatred for evil. I pray you just protect us and guard our hearts and our minds from the evil one and from the, the lies and the slander and the deception that's going on out there and, and the confusion that's so prevalent in this day and age as we see the enemy trying to do whatever he can 
began to destroy people's lives, to destroy churches, and the movement that you have for these local fellowships. And so we pray for just an outpouring of your spirit upon your precious people. We thank you that uh, you've kept us and, and how you're keeping us and how you are preserving us and sanctifying us and how you have called us. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life through a personal love relationship with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.